will go ahead and officially welcome you to our sensory session today. We will be looking at moderating acidity and sparkling wine base. Um, as we go through the day today, um, again, please feel free to participate in discussion as much as possible. There's a lot of um, a lot of group knowledge out there, so we would really love to hear what your what your perspective is as well. Um, let's go ahead and get started, maybe by introducing ourselves. If you guys want to use the chat function, if you want to just write your name and whatever vineyard or winery you're coming to us from, um, I'm Joy Ting, and I'm the research analogist for the Winemakers Research Exchange. And maybe I'll have our, our guest, Mathieu, introduce himself as well so that his, his window comes up into my speaker view. <laughs> Hello, it's Mathieu, King Family Vineyards. I hope everybody is yummy, good. Yes, you are good. Um, as you are introducing yourselves, I will go ahead and also put the report for today's, um, for today's session into the chat. So if you do want to have um, your own set of those those tables and graphs. Um, if you want to have a little bit more information on the background information that can be in there as well. And then I will go ahead and start sharing my screen. There we go. All right. So as we get started today, um, as you're let me see if we can see the chat. Here we go. I'm going to also, um, as you continue to put your name in the in the chat there, welcome to everybody. I will, um, maybe we can get started with a poll question as we will be talking about traditional method sparkling today. I wanted to ask um, who out there does make traditional me method sparkling wine? And if you do, um, which what, what types of vessels do you use to do your fermentation? So are you fermenting in stainless steel? in neutral oak barrels or in other barrels or in some other other form. And if you're using some other vessel, maybe write into the chat what other type of vessel you're using. Um, and then do you let your base wines go through malolactic fermentation? And I gave you a never, sometimes, and always. Hopefully that gives us enough, enough clarification there. Okay, we'll let that go just for another minute. But as we do that, um, I think I thought it might be a good thing to start today just by talking a little bit about sparkling, about the base wine for sparkling in general. So, you know, a lot of folks are are making a regular, for example, regular Chardonnay. The base wine we're looking at today is a Chardonnay base. Um, but the way that we would think about making the base wine for sparkling from Chardonnay grapes is, is somewhat a little, somewhat different and somewhat the same for, for regular base wine. So um, I thought, Mathieu, maybe we could start with, maybe I'd, I'd start by asking you, when you're thinking about making your sparkling wine base versus making your regular Chardonnay, what are some of the things that you think about in terms of maybe differences in the winemaking that you that you need to keep in mind when you're making that sparkling wine base? Harvest date, that would be the first uh, <laughs> the first thing. Uh, it's pretty logic, but it's, uh, uh, it's a really a different wine to make. So you have to take that in consideration, uh, even on the vineyard side. Uh, so you, you, have, you cannot decide like mid-July, oh, I'm going to do a sparkling, because most likely somebody has do some captain on the vineyard and then you have uh, some mancozet on the vineyard and then you cannot harvest your sparkling. So it's, you still need to plan it a little bit in advance. Uh, but uh, after, uh, uh, I think what makes a good sparkling is the acidity. And, uh, and so uh, it's most likely probably more important than the, than the bricks in, in that matters. Uh, but again, I mean, uh, you know, uh, old disclaimer, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not a champagne expert. I've been making champagne for more than uh, uh, for a while now, for 15 years. But I'm, I'm still I still don't consider myself as a, a champagne person. So you know, some some people can disagree with me on that. Well, and and maybe we'll ask. It looks like let me go ahead and and share the results of our poll here. It looks like about 70% of the people on our on our call today do make traditional method sparkling. Um, we have kind of a split between barrels and, and stainless steel, and I'm curious to know what the other is. So whomever that other is, if you could tell us what else you're, you're fermenting in. Um, but given the number of folks on the call that are making sparkling base, 
you know, I'd, I'd toss that question out for you also. Are there other things, what else are you thinking about when you're making your sparkling wine in terms of how to make that base wine into something that really makes into an excellent sparkling? If anybody feels comfortable kind of unmuting yourselves and talking, that would be great. If not, maybe you want to put a couple of things into the chat, some some characteristics of, of good sparkling wine base. So um, again, that thinking about that early that early date, that high that good acidity, anything else that comes to mind? I, I think I think if I if I can keep going into into the process, I think there's also uh, the cleanliness of the juice. I mean, you, the uh, the press is very important. I mean, you 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 realize that once you press harder, uh, your pH is going to go up. Uh, you're gonna your wine's going to be more herbaceous and less interesting for sparkling. So I think the, the press fraction is something that's also very, very important. Uh, again, being clean, I think, is, is key uh, for good sparkling wine. Uh, but that's not another one. Yeah. Well, we did it. When I, was, when I was sort of preparing for this, there were some things that consistently came up in the references that I looked at as well. Um, so just as Metu said, sort of that overall idea of the, the juice being clean, but even just the grapes being being very clean without any any sense of rot. We always want our grapes to be clean with no rot. But we have to kind of keep in mind that we're going to be going through a very low sulfur environment and any amount of browning or, or lacase activity is going to oxidize the wine and really, really show a lot when we get to the sparkling um, the, the point where that wine is sparkling. Um, again, Metu brought this up, but just really being really very aware of freshness, both to have good acidity for, for the sensory part of freshness, but also having good pHs for microbial stability, right? Being able to, to limit any microbial spoilage that might be able, might be occurring. Um, one thing that was really interesting to me in terms of thinking about this is that oftentimes we're really looking for a lot of varietal character, a lot of varietal aromatic. And a lot of times in sparkling wine, it, the, the base one, that doesn't matter so much. And in, in fact, some of the, the resources I looked at said, you know, you almost want to limit those for a certain type of sparkling wine um, to allow those tertiary characteristics of the yeast to, to show through. So that whether or not the grapes are neutral might depend on what type of sparkling wine you're trying to make. Very important to avoid any off aromas. So any, any hints of, you know, H2S or volatile acidity or any of those things, as soon as you sparkle the wine, any of those things are going to be amplified as well. And then getting back to that idea that Mitch, you already said in terms of ripeness, we want to avoid the, those super herbal characters, um, but also avoiding overripe grapes on the other side. That's the making sure you, you pick on time um, just because that can lead, a heavy, lead to a heaviness in the, in the sensory, but also higher alcohol that can impede your secondary fermentation later. So um, anything else here coming in? Ben Jordan says, are folks using later ripening varieties than Chardonnay? So picking in early August is not our favorite. So that's a great question, Ben. Um, you know, our folks, maybe that's a, a good question. What, what types of varieties are you using for your, for your traditional method sparkling? Um, Metu, this was, this pick was obviously Chardonnay. Do you make other, um, other traditional method out of a different variety or it's just Chardonnay for you? No, just Chardonnay. Um, yeah. Okay. Classic. Yeah. <laughs> How about our other sparkling producers out there? I know um, at, like at Wineworks, we would use um, a direct press of Cabernet Franc as, if, as the base for the Blanc de Franc. And so that would come in a little bit later um, just because your Cabernet Franc is going to come out later than that. Um, if, if you have others out there, maybe write that into the chat and we can check back with that in just a minute. Um, so Mathieu, tell us, we, we kind of want to start here by saying that as we move into talking about the experiment, the experiment itself was not planned from the beginning. And so we'll sort of, Mathieu will tell you kind of the story of how this evolved, but just to say that um, it's great that he's willing to share this with us as it evolved during the course of harvest this year, but but there are a couple of elements that 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 maybe aren't exactly what we would have planned ahead of time, but I think we still have a really good comparison um, to make as we keep going along. So that being said, Mathieu, how did you, tell us a little bit about how all of this started. What, how did you start on this line of inquiry? What was the problem that presented itself? And what did you start to think about in terms of solutions? 
I mean, this experimentation was not planned, but I think 2020 wasn't planned. Or if it was planned, it was a completely different plan. Uh, it didn't go as we were expected for so many reasons. Uh, but uh, I'm not even going to go on the COVID side or the frost or anything. It's just 2020 was challenging altogether. Uh, even in the growing season, we ended up having wine with uh, very low bricks uh, to start with, uh, but also very high level of Malik. Uh, and, uh, but pH that were also fairly high. Uh, so high TA, high Malik, high pH, low bricks. I mean, it's, it was making harvest decision was uh, not easy, I will say. Uh, and that's where you have to decide, uh, you know, what's, what your harvest parameters and what, 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 when you decide to pick and what you decide to pick. And um, the, the, this, uh, this sparkling that we've done, we, um, because we've been frosted at the winery, we had to buy grapes from another vineyard. So on top of that, it's a vineyard that, I'm, that I don't fully know. Uh, so, you know, you have to also play with like a difference when it comes to like, you know, ripening numbers, a lot of things. My, because the pitch was fairly high, um, I, I really freaked out and didn't know what to do with it. And I even tried to um, uh, do a cold stabilization on juice, um, just to try to, uh, um, you know, I saw that maybe the reason why the pH was high was because of the potassium. Uh, and I was trying to basically get the potassium to precipitate, uh, to try to also in the same way, reduce my TA. Uh, and uh, ultimately, if I needed to reacidify to get a better uh, reacidification behind it. Um, but I don't think, I mean, for obvious reasons that we've talked with Joy after, but I don't think by uh, cold stabilization on juice, I did anything. I didn't have any change of pH. I, I didn't have any change of, of TA, but also what I've noticed is my malic acid was very high. So I've done some analysis for my malic acid. I think Joy's got all the numbers. I don't have them with me right now, but we um, uh, my malic super high, uh, and I didn't know what to do with with this wine. Um, traditionally in uh, in uh, in Champagne, I mean not traditional, yeah, traditionally in Champagne. Um, they harvest with very, very high um, TA uh, and, and very often very low pH. Uh, but very often they try to do the malolactic fermentation uh, on, on, their, um, on their sparkling. Um, for us in, in Virginia, because we were much warmer weather, uh, very often it's debatable uh, about like, should we do the malolactic fermentation on the sparkling or not? Most of the time we don't need to do it because our, our pH and our, our TA are not I mean, I'm not in the right numbers to do my active fermentation. But because my malic was so high, because my uh, my total acidity was high, I, I was really didn't know how the wine's going to taste. Um, and um, and um, I decided to try different options to how to manage this uh, this wine. And so I, I, even with having a high TA, uh, high malic will lead you to high lactic. If you do the malolactic fermentation, I still decided to try to do some malolactic fermentation on some of the barrels, uh, just to try to see how it's going to play on the on the structure, on the mouthfeel uh, of, of the wine, and uh, and to try to understand how to uh, to manage this wine properly. Um, so I think that's going to be a big part of what we're going to be talking later. So I'm not going to go too deep into that. Um, but, but that's, uh, you know, that's the way it happened. I, I was in the situation, I didn't know much what to do, to be honest. I, I was like, uh, I didn't know, even know if the wine would be drinkable. And, you know, it's, it's, it's one, uh, one thing if, uh, if, um, if I had, you know, like two or three barrels, I would not worry too much about like if the wine would be drinkable or not. But here I've got 150 hectoliters of it, uh, so uh, that start to be a lot of wine when you are like six, over 1,600 cases um, of, of sparkling. Uh, if the stuff is not drinkable, it's going to be difficult for me to justify um, the fact that I'm going to send that to distillation. So hopefully we can. Well, we 
we'll, we'll navigate through some of the options that could be possible during that time. So, um, so before we move on though, uh, we do have a couple of folks that have piped into Ben's question here. Um, so Ben, just remember, Ben um, asked if people are using later ripening varieties than Chardonnay just because of the logistics of picking Chardonnay so early. Um, like Michael Henney says it, that he's done Method Champenois and Viognier, um, and more recently on Chardonnay, which is a, yeah, which would be a little later. Uh, Randy Phillips from Cape Ridge says that they're using Riesling in their Charmant process. Um, and Craig Allshouse says that currently they've got Saval Blanc and Merlot in process. So some of those other options um, that might come in a little bit later. So, um, so as Mitch, you said, basically the idea here was to deal with moderating the acidity in this, in this particular sparkling wine base that came in with some really different sparkling wine numbers. So as we started kind of down this track and, and Mathieu and I spoke about this, I think just about as soon as this fruit started coming in, um, I remember sitting in the lab at, at King Family trying to talk through what some of the options might be here. But just to kind of orient what the normal fruit chemistry targets might be for sparkling wine base, um, these come from two different sources I'm gonna lean on pretty heavily um, for this particular material. Um, Bruce Stockland wrote a kind of a, a informative mini booklet. I don't know, it's, it's, it's mini booklet, I'm sorry, either large booklet or a mini book. Um, on Method Champenois that you can get off of the Virginia Tech Enology um, site. And it, it still has a lot of very useful information. So if you're interested in, in kind of a kind of soup to nuts, like front to back Method Champenois explanation, that's a good one. And then also Eno France came through a couple of years ago and did a, a seminar on sparkling wine. They also left a, a number of, um, of resources um, that I'm happy to disseminate to you all as well that, that give us some of these numbers. But as we can see that, you know, when we're looking at the, the overall BRICS and pH and TA targets here, these are still relatively low BRICS targets relative to, to other Chardonnay, um, but the pHs are also very low. When we look at what Mathieu was dealing with this year, this was a pick off of a, a vineyard that was, was picked in multiple different picks over the course of, of at least 11 days. But the BRICS targets are sort of even lower than that, which you can deal with with chapelization. The pH is already pretty high. Um, and the TA, given what, what's going to be needed to, to correct that pH, that TA may also be getting pretty high. So if we look back at kind of what the what what is listed here for champagne, as as Mathieu pointed out, you know, we see that the, the malic acid targets here are actually pretty high, but with the idea that that malic acid can be at least partially dealt with through malolactic. And so that's really the, the, the beginning of this experiment was to say, what happens if we let some of this go through malolactic? We acidulate it back to a reasonable pH and then we let it go through malolactic. What does that do in terms of the chemistry and in terms of the sensory as a sparkling wine base? Um, so so there's, there's one thing that, uh, that I'd like to add with, uh, with the previous uh, uh, reading is again, like, uh, I've, when I started making sparkling, uh, one of my uh, friends from uh, from school was from Champagne, and when I asked him, you know, what what are you picking uh, characteristic when you decide to pick uh, sparkling uh, in Champagne style, his his comment was like three nine nine. Uh, so uh, three will be the pH, nine will be the total acidity, but the total acidity in France is measured in H two SO four, so that will be uh, that will be something like fourteen. Um, uh, sorry, 13, yeah, around 13. It will be nine, uh, so 13 of TA, and the other nine will be the potential alcohol. So nine of potential alcohol. So it was a, a, a very easy um, um, trick to remember. But even if you look at, at, the, at the recommended stuff from Inner France or, or Bruce, uh, you know, like you, you, you realize that in fact, my, in some way, my, 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 my pH is high, but my TA is also low. If you really regard to uh, some of the picking characteristics from uh, um, from Europe, uh, I mean from France, but but one of the things that was not normal, I think, was uh, I mean I, I feel like my my Malik was very high, and now that I see some other stuff, I may, maybe it wasn't that high, but maybe I should have picked up earlier. But this year, being so diluted, when you harvest something at 14 breaks. And, and 
you know, it's it's feel low already. Uh, and thinking that I should have picked it at what 13 breaks doesn't make much sense. So, like really like the correlation between the breaks because of the rain and and then the acid um, ultimately was was the main, main challenge on on this um, on, 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 uh, this year. So. And one of the one of the other things that was in Bruce's um, publication was the the general idea of having a, a um, sugar to acid ratio of between 15 and 20 when sugar is in grams per liter. Um, and again, by that measure, you know our, our our French numbers here are kind of right right there. Um, Mathieu, your numbers are either too high or too low. And so I think we see that too. Thank you. That like, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 there's not really the, the balance is off in this, right? So that's really yeah. what's happening in this year. But but in the end, as winemakers, as you said, you know, we don't always have the idea to say I can just opt out of the vintage, but rather what can I do with, with what I have? So let's let's jump into what you actually ended up doing. Um, there we go. And we are going to spend just a little bit of time, a little more time on methods than normal, just because again with sparkling wine base, there's a couple things that are a little bit different here. Um, the grapes were whole cluster pressed using the sparkling program on the press. And so those whole clusters give some, some ability, the, the, the stems give some ability for drainage with a really gentle sparkling program. If you're interested in kind of the, the ins and outs of the press program itself, the Eno France, met, uh, the Eno, Eno France references have a lot of, of really interesting stuff on the press programs. And like I said, I'm happy to um, share that with you. Um, Mathieu added about 23 parts of sulfur. Um, again, in the things that I was reading, we think about sparkling as sort of managing in a really low sulfur environment, but, but both Bruce and Eno France are like, you know, at the, at the press, you can feel free to add what you need to add. And they were mentioning numbers between like 30 and 60, but just really adding that in the pan or in the tank and not in the press itself. Because the whole idea, as Mathieu said before, is to get a really clean juice so you don't have phenolics and you're not having any skin skin impact there, adding SO2 in the press is going to give you a little more maceration off the skin. So um, the the again, the, the white pressings, the cuvee, that was about two thirds of the volume in, that went into, to, into making the, the sparkling base. Um, about one third of the volume went into the tie. And again, you can do that diversion based on a number of different um, different criteria, but they all sort of come around the same place where um, if we think about how the how the grape is, um, you know, most of the sugar and the acid is right in that nice meat in the middle of the grape. Um, whereas the things along the skins are the things that we kind of don't want in our sparkling wine base. So we don't want to have potassium, we don't want to have phenolic. So pressing too hard is going to give us that. So that early part of the press gives us the nice nice juicy part in the middle that has good acid and good sugar. Once we start pressing harder, that might still be good juice for something, but it's not as good for sparkling base. So that's why it gets diverted. Um, as Mitch, you mentioned, he did try this, try to use some cream of tartar to get the potassium, some of the potassium potentially out of the tank. Um, I would just say, we're gonna talk about that a lot more in a, another set of experiments that Mitch, you did um, in our June tasting on June the 3rd. So if you're kind of wondering what that's all about, Come back on June third, and we'll talk about that in um, in a in a much uh, much more detailed way. I probably won't do it again for the cream of tartar again. Like yeah. in, in juice form, having a, a tartrate pre precipitation, it's almost impossible. So it's yeah, just a waste I, of time. I, I, I think that it works much better when you've got alcohol around. It doesn't work so much when you've got all that sugar and all that all that water. So. Um, so once the juice was racked, though, Mitch, you you inoculated, and you don't always inoculate. So I wanted to say just a little. I wanted to talk a little bit about why are you inoculating your sparkling, and how do you choose your yeast? Uh, again, like you want something neutral, uh, and uh, and granted, there's some wine that I, there's some chardonnay that I do with uh, non-inoculation, but sometimes I end up with having some beers that are still acceptable but higher than what you need for sparkling uh we'll talk more about VA later anyway but uh, still like you know it's a uh, uh dv10 is a it's solid it's very neutral uh i mean you want something very neutral again you don't want something that's gonna develop a lot of flavor and i think it's a so steady yeast you, you you've got very little reduction so very little h2s um so yeah it's uh you know Again, here I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing a, a natural wine, uh, so you know it's. Uh, I just want it to be clean. Yeah. 
So you also added bentonite and casein in the middle of the fermentation. So you want to say just just a minute what those are no, there for? No, 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 just in uh, just in the tank fermentation, not not in the oh, barrel fermentation. In the tank. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, you want to say what it's for in the tank? Uh, I mean, I always use uh, bentonite and casein as a, as an habit when I ferment in tank. Uh, casein can help to remove a little bit of uh, oxidative uh, and, and bitterness in the wine. Uh, and, and bentonite, you know, like when I think of it, I, I had no need to do it on the, on the sparkling because sparkling usually has got, because it's Chardonnay that it's under ripe, you don't have a lot of protein anyway. Uh, so there's no real need of adding uh, uh, bentonite it's not like Gunier or Sauvignon Blanc where I really need to add bentonite during fermentation. But I do, do feel that it helps me to get a, a good clean fermentation and something that I'm doing almost, you know, I'll probably write down the work order on this one without, you know. <laughs> well, one of the things, I, I brought it up because one of the things I noticed in the reading was they, they talked about, you know, not necessarily for protein stability here, but if you do have any lacase around, bentonite and casein might help take that out. And so, yeah, but I hope I don't have any lacase because, again, like if you have lacase, it means that your fruit is compromised to start with, therefore, you should not do sparkling with it. Good point. <laughs> um, so, there was a, an acid addition again to correct that pH, and some sugar was added because we had low bricks. These were, and again, we went into, there were eight barrels total. They were neutral oak, they were basically neutral oak barrels, they were older oak barrels, and then also into a tank. Um, Couple other things here. A lot of uh, Mathieu doesn't add nutrients, which is is works for it, for his winery. One of the things they do talk about in the in the um, in the textbooks would really just to make sure you have a good nutrition um, environment. So I think Amanda was was good to say a couple of weeks ago that you know if things are working for you and you don't have stuck fermentations and you're not getting H two S, then just keep doing what you're doing. Um, but just keeping in mind that nutrient add there is really for the idea that if you are getting H2S, that's going to, or VA, those things are going to be exacerbated once you, once you sparkle the wine. Um, and then also just recognizing that, that temperature is another kind of thing that might be, um, might affect some things about our fermentation. So we had some barrels and we had a tank. Um, the barrels, we didn't have the temperatures on these. We didn't have very much, tem much temperature inf information on this, but Warmer temperatures are going to give us a little bit more neutral of a wine, and our cooler temperatures we would expect would give us a little bit more fruit and floral. But that's not always that we don't always see all of that, and we'll see the example of that in just a couple of minutes. So the setup of the experiment then was we had eight barrels total. Four of them were meant to be allowed to go through malolactic, where four of them were treated in a way to make them stop. Um, and then the tank itself uh, was also treated in a way to make it stop. So Matthew, do you want to talk about what you did to try to make it stop? Uh, yeah, so uh, to, uh, uh, I mean, usually uh, I never had any problem uh, stopping malolactic fermentation because it, I just had, had uh, usually like uh, per barrel, it's like a tablet of sulfur. So it's like five grams per barrel. So it's 2.2 grams per hectoliter, 22 ppm. But usually when you've got a pH that is like around three, like your your 22 ppm goes a uh, of 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 sulfur addition goes a long way, um, and uh, and usually that's enough to prevent malolactic fermentation. Uh, but on on this time because uh, you know uh, I feel my pH was a bit higher, I did add some ketosan at the same time. Uh, so I, I I did add a bit of ketosan with uh, with my uh, sulfur addition. Uh, we'll see in a minute. Okay, yes. <laughs> so, so when we look at the, so just so that you know what's in front of you, the first flight then is going to be the comparison between the barrel fermentation that only went through alcoholic fermentation and the barrel fermentation that was allowed to go through malolactic. So in case you're reading this off of a tiny little screen, I'll go ahead and read these out loud to make sure that we can, you know what's in front of you. If you're in group one, Wines 200 underwent alcoholic fermentation. Wines 534 and 409 underwent malolactic fermentation. If you're in group two, wines 418 and 796 went through alcoholic fermentation only, and wine 679 went through malolactic fermentation. If you're in group three, wines 847 and 555 went through alcoholic fermentation and wine 220 went through malolactic fermentation. And if you're in group four, 
wine 151 went through alcoholic only and wines 510 and 836 went through malolactic. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at what we found then. So again, there were eight barrels total of this and we did do general chemistry for all eight barrels of that. And when we went to go do that chemistry, we realized that we had one barrel left that had not gone through mallow and seven barrels that had. So even some of the barrels that Mathieu was trying to prevent from going through mallow did go through mallow. Um, what we can see, so what you see with the, with the data there is under the, on the malolactic column, that's the average for the seven barrels and the number in parentheses is the standard deviation. So it gives you an idea of what kind of variation we had within those seven barrels. The one barrel that you're tasting, the, the information for that is that third line that says sensory, that's your malo, that's the, the wine you have in front of you for malolactic, the one that we chose for that. And we basically just chose it as the one that was the twin barrel for the one that didn't go through alcoholic. So we can very quickly see here that we do have a big difference in volatile acidity between the barrel that, the barrels that went through um, malolactic have higher, considerably higher VA than the ones that went through alcoholic. Um, we do see also a big difference in pH um, as a result of that and the difference in TA. Now those are all things that we expect for malolactic fermentation, but it's interesting to see sort of what magnitude of difference that we would see there. And again, just realizing that we started with a fair, fair amount of malic acid here. So, you know, five and a half grams is not, not a small amount of malolactic to start with. And so we do see that big shift. Now, Mathieu was, this isn't the only um, lot of of this, this isn't the only pick that, that Mathieu did this with. He did the same thing with a, a pick that came in a, a few days later. And so I wanted to share that information with you as well, just to see if that kind of, um, if, if what we see happening in, in the one that we're doing sensory on also holds in the one that we're, one that we're not tasting. And it, and it really does. In this case, we had three barrels that were in, that did not go through complete malolactic and five barrels that did. And I will say that, that, that column for alcoholic there, that was anything that hadn't completed mallow. So you'll notice there's a little bit more variation in that one. Some of those had gone through a little bit of malolactic before um, we caught them and they got stopped. So, but we see that same, that same, um, trend once again that we do see that that consider or that notable increase in volatile acidity that that is a significant difference there um, as well as diff those differences in pH and TA. So again these are things that we expect to have happen with mallow but just looking at how much that 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 shifts I think is is really interesting to me um, to see. So um, as we move into kind of the the sensory part, let me see if I can get to my next poll here. Um, ben is asking if I initiated for mallow, no, it's all native uh, mallow -like fermentation. I'm sorry? Ben was asking if I did inoculate for mallow, uh, no, it's all native. I didn't inoculate anything. Okay. Um, uh, so, yeah, so if you could let me know if you were, were you able to tell the difference between the wines? And then thinking about, so Mathieu, we actually kind of skipped over this. What is the, what is the eventual um, destination for this base wine? What are you making out of it? So um, as a, like winemaking wise, what are you hoping this base wine will, will taste like? Um, I've got two, uh, two wines that, uh, that's gonna, that I'm gonna make with this, uh, with these different batches. Uh, uh, one is uh, is a, what we call our brut. Uh, it's uh, just a blanc de blanc. Uh, uh, so that's usually get aged for two years on lease before it gets uh, gets bottled uh, before it gets disgorged. And the other one is uh, is a, a rosé uh, that we're going to do uh, uh, with a tirage. Uh, and uh, the rosé um, is uh, aged for a little bit less longer. And the rosé is also going to might have a little bit more um, uh, more dosage, so a bit more potential uh, high, higher uh, residual sugar. Uh, we're still going to I'm still targeting around uh, one percent on, on the rosé, but uh, I need more acid for the rosé to balance uh, the slightly higher dosage. Okay, so um, let me go ahead and, and end the poll here. So it does look like 
most people, we did have a, a significant number of people that were able to tell the difference. And so maybe if you, if you want to write into the chat, um, what are some of the things that, that tasted different for you? Or if you want to unmute yourself, we'd love to hear from you too. But what are the, what kind of things helped you to be able to tell the difference there? Um, and so Matthew, I would ask you too, are you, what do you think about in terms of the differences between these two wines? Well, in, in fact, I was, I was surprised because um, uh, I've misread them. I mean, I've, I've found the difference between the two wines, but I've misread them. Uh, I, I, I almost feel like that I had more lactic component into the, into the, the wine that were with no matter lactic fermentation. Um, so, um, so again, um, you know, I, I think I'll, uh, ultimately, I think I should not have done the malolactic fermentation on this wine. Um, because I, uh, even if the malic was high and everything was, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's already too rich. And, and again, having like 3.4 pH on a, on a wine that you want to do the sparkling, it's even, it will even be too high for my regular uh, Chardonnay. So, so, you know, I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not working only on, uh, on numbers here, but, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's, I already had it 1.5 grams per, per liter uh, during the, during the pro uh, process. And uh, I mean, the, the wine's been ripe now, getting ready to bottle it soon. And I've been adding another one gram on uh, on top of it. So you know, you do a sparkling. You obviously already like with a very high TA, and I ended up dumping more um, tartaric acid into the wine. Uh, you know, defeat the purpose of. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I was so much more afraid of the Malik, uh, and I, I think the wine can take it much much better than I thought it will. I remember when we first when we first visited about this. You said, you know, maybe. Um, you know, maybe I'll do this in barrel and just let our, let the batonnage kind of do its work, right? You've been doing yeah. batonnage on these barrels once a week, um, you know, up until up until it was time to blend them. And so I, I wonder too, it, like you said, if, if that really did have an, a nice um, effect of trying to kind of give you a little bit more balance and what, what we were initially perceiving as being a really sharp malic acid. But but also, I mean, what I've learned with, uh, with this batch is, uh, in fact, uh, you know, I need to be much more aggressive with uh, uh, ketosan or, or with more higher level of sulfur to prevent the malolactic fermentation. Because if I leave it in barrels, uh, you know, I thought the other years I was able to, to keep my malolactic fermentation to start. And I'm not going to say that I was 100% without malolactic fermentation going. But, uh, but I was very surprised on this one where I tried to do the right thing to not get the malolactic fermentation happen. And yet it did happen. You know, uh, for me that was a bit surprising. So, um, and there's other one where I don't I want it to happen and it doesn't happen, and the one that you know. So again, it's a, we also it's wine with low alcohol, so it's much more. It would be easier for the malolactic fermentation to start working. But again, for something that's not inoculated, I, I was very surprised how fast it, it went off. Yeah, I mean, I think when we when we think about whether mallow is 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 difficult to get to go or not you did have a lot of things going for you in terms of your mallow you were in a low sulfur environment it was a barrel ferment so it was slightly warmer you didn't have that coolness of the tank to keep it um but like you said normally your ph alone will do that and it just wasn't doing it for you this year so we have a couple mm -hmm. questions that came into the chat so any um jesse wants to know if there's any issue with using a yeast that oops that just jumped anything any issue with using yeast that metabolizes malic um instead of using mal and instead of using mlf um i'm not sure jesse that's a good question i think you know there are these yeasts out there that will basically metabolize your malic and not produce lactic acid as part of that so you don't have that shift in the flavor profile as much i guess my first question would just be are they going to be a nice um steady fermenter to avoid h2s and to avoid um, volatile acidity and also are you going to be getting um varietal character that you want or you don't want with that so those would be a couple of questions um, I would ask about it. I'm I'm not sure um, the answer there. Um, I mean, uh, 71B, 71B, for example, is known to produce a lot of ester. Okay. So, so you know, I mean, a lot of banana component and things like that. Uh, I'll, 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 I mean, it could work, but I'm not sure that's what I want. Yeah. 
And I, I'll have to look it up. I'm not sure if, if Beth knows if that the the pathway that actually shunts the shunts the to the malic acid um, depletion may also itself produce some aromatics that we may or may not want in in sparkling wine. Beth, do you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know as pertains to the 71B alternate pathway, but what Mathieu described would be um, like the isoamyl acetate, those acetate esters. So I have to look into whether there's some correlation in the in the pathway there that would lead to an increase in production by using that that method. Yeah, I think um, it does. I think it shunts it off of the citric acid cycle and it shunts it over. But it's been yeah. a little bit since I've looked at that chemistry. So <laughs> thanks. Um, so does Sean is asking. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, Shai is asking, um, it, oh, he's saying that in group two, there were the two that were only primary had a distinct Buddha's hand aroma. I'm not uh, familiar with that. Um, is that, does anyone know, Shai, can you describe the Buddha's hand aroma? Um, and that wasn't there in the ML. And also the ML was softer with an evident TAs difference. Yeah, so we could, we definitely could see that in the chemistry, but it's interesting to see that that showed up also in the, um, in the sensory. Um, and, and it's interesting because the oftentimes I think we get these comments a lot about the differences in like, was this one in a newer barrel or an older barrel? In this case, they were both in, in barrels that came from the same Cooper that had been around King family for the same amount of time. So sometimes it might just be whether the presence or like that difference in the, pre in the perception of acidity might be shifting our difference in some of those other perceptions. But we're, we're usually really careful to try to make sure that we're in, in the same vessel unless that's part of the experiment. Um, so Michael Henney has a question. I think this one's for you, Matthew. What are your thoughts yeah. about bottling with a higher yeast content for further softening during bottling? I don't think you need to hire with higher bottling uh, with yeast content. That's my my take because then you uh, you might get a fermentation that goes faster in bottle and that might defeat what you're trying to do. Uh, no, but uh, again, to get back to your point, my my regular brew is going to age for two years in uh, uh, at least two years on lees before it's going to get this gorge. So you get a fair amount of softening during the two years. So I don't need, I think, to have a higher yeast content to uh, to so soften uh, to soften the wine. I think the the lease aging will do it. And um, for the roses that I age only one year, uh, you know, there's magic trick that's called sugar and that works very well to soften any wine with high acid. And that's probably what I will be using. I would also say, um, and Michael, I'm I'm happy to share this with you. The the, when Eno France came a, a couple of years ago and they presented, basically they presented like the, the process of putting the, the sparkling in the bottle. They had these studies where they looked at different amounts of yeast going in initially. And it's, it, as Mitch, you said, there's differences in the, in the fermentation itself and the temperature, but also it can, if you have too many yeast bodies in there, you can have trouble with riddling and getting it properly disgorged after two. Um, so that would be, it depends on how high that yeast content would be. Um, but there are a couple of things that might go along with that. So, yeah. Um, so so the, the, those um, points are def definitely taken. My, my thoughts would be rather than having uh, may maybe yeast added as part of the buildup phase, maybe if, if you had some some leaves around that were collected so that just, just a way of, of ha having a little more um, yeast cells working with autolysis, trying to find that sweet spot of, of not speeding up the fermentation too, too much but uh, ending up in bottle with, with a high, higher um, yeast, yeast cell uh, con content. Point totally taken about um, no, nobody wants a difficult to riddle a sp sparkling wine, <laughs> um, but I tend to find that's more with kind of some tartrate instabilities. But anyways, that's, that's what, where my thinking was. Uh, the, the other thing about uh, and ben, was, uh, ben Jordan was oh. suggested to use some uh, some of the uh, leaves from uh, from the primary fermentation. Again, here I'm going to self-filter my wine before I'm going to start the second fermentation and adding some leaves where I've got potential malolactic bacteria that might uh, affect my, I mean, uh, it's for me, I just see it as a recipe for disaster when I can just change uh, my dosage uh, at, uh, at disgorging and get the same level of softness that I want. And also, I do find sometimes that my um, my sparkling uh, has got a tendency to be after two years of aging, and because of the 
you know, fairly low acid that we've got. Usually, I, I do find my, my sparkling to be a little bit too soft. Um, so having a little bit, something a bit fighty is not scares me too much. Um, okay, so one more comment on this and then we will move to our second flight. So Beth um, says that she got a lot of grapefruit rind, blood orange, lemon on the nose and the, in the alcoholic only. Um, and not in the in the Malik, and she she really liked that and found that enjoyable. And I think when we looked at um, when when we sort of with that poll question of which one do we think best achieved the winemaking goal, that sort of freshness and that sort of thing, I think the 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 um, the majority of folks were feeling like that was the case with the alcoholic. So, okay, so let's go on to flight two. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again so that we can see the slide. So, let me get there. Get there. There we go. Okay. So for flight two, then just to, to sort of recap, we flight two was um, a comparison between that same barrel that only went underwent alcoholic fermentation and the the tank sample, which only went underwent alcoholic fermentation, but obviously fermented in a tank. So you were in group one. Uh, sample seven seven eight and five eight two were both tank samples. Uh, two oh seven was from the barrel. If you're in group two, uh, uh, let's see, 999 nine, nine, and 639 were both from the tank and 232 two was from the barrel. If you're in group three, 573 was from the tank, 389 and 734 were from the barrel. And if you're in group four, 499 was from the tank, uh, 905 and 548 from the barrel. Uh, so when we look at that again, just to, this is mostly the same information I just showed you, but I just added the tank up at the top here, much like we would expect the, the tank sample, the, the general chemistry in the tank was much the same as what we found in the barrel that underwent alcoholic. The difference here in total acid, total acid two was actually, there was, there was an acid addition. The, the tank sample was taken like a couple of weeks later and there had been an, an SO2 addition in there. So some of that difference in total SO2 was probably just due, due to SO, uh, SO2 addition during that time. Um, and we do see a difference here in alcohol. And again, that was that was a difference in chaptalization between the two. These weren't originally meant to be kind of right up right next to each other. So do keep that in mind as you look at your sensory. Um, and I thought I would just add a little bit on the bottom here. We looked at the, the recommended um, harvest parameters from both Eno France and the Zocklin paper. This gives us sort of those base wine parameters and we can kind of see where we're landing with regard to those. I think in this case, the alcohols are still a little bit low, but they're within, within range. The ages are a little bit high, but they're kind of um, you know closer than they were at, at harvest for sure. I will say that the Eno France um, paper was mostly talking about don't go below 2.9 or you'll have a problem with your second fermentation. Whereas Zocklin was going, saying, don't go above 3.3 or you'll have some problems with microbial stability or with sensory. So just realizing that those are sort of answering, those numbers come from answering different questions. Um, but in that case, again, we just, we can see that we were, we're inching toward um, a little, toward that sort of higher VA number in the malolactic, although um, by Bruce's reckoning, in most cases, we would still be low enough with the mallow there, so. Um, but again, the more important thing is really what that tastes like or what that seems like for sensory. Let me see if we can get to our last poll here. Launch that guy. Okay, so um, so for this one, we can see if we were able to tell the difference and if so, what that difference was. There we go. So, and again, if you were able to tell the difference, if you're willing, maybe you can write into the chat some of the things that, that might have helped you to, to distinguish the two wines from each other. And again, thinking about what would be best for that, for that winemaking goal of getting to the, the, that middle part, which again, I mean, blending helps as well. So, so I'll go back to you, met you on this. What do you think about the, the tank versus the barrels? Um, I, I mean, I think like there's something that I like with the tank. It's, um, it's a brightness. I mean, again, it's like, it's very crisp, uh, maybe too much, but at least it's, it's very sharp and very crisp. Uh, and I think for example, for, uh, 
that will be used into my rosé uh, batch uh, because I, I feel like I, it's going to get me this brightness that I'm looking for. Uh, but as a stylistic, um, as a stylistic for what I do here usually for my regular uh, for the brut for the blanc de blanc, I think the barrel fermentation is definitely more um, where I want to be, but with no with no matter like fermentation. Okay. So yeah, so it looks like we had a lot of people be able to tell the difference between the wines. So again, if you if you're willing, maybe write into the chat and tell us what was different for for you between those those wines. My chat might be getting stuck a little bit, so it seems to be loading slowly. Anybody? Any differences between these wines that helped you? Lots of people were able to tell the difference here. Okay, Nate feels like the tank is sharper and more angular. The barrel sam yeah. sample has a nice roundness. Yeah, I think, Mitchu, when you and I first tasted it too, I feel like that was that was uh, there. And mostly that's probably because of the barrel, although that difference in alcohol might give us just a little bit of that as well. Um, and the baton also, I mean, about that batonage, so you did develop some, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. you developed some honest with the batonage. Yeah. Ben feels like there was more depth of flavor in the barrels, for sure. Um, and Michael Henney is this for, for your ro rosé, what base wine will you use for your dosage to achieve your target color? And how much of that does that usually take? Petit Verdot, and uh, it depends of, uh, you know, I'm... Uh, because, you know, when I go with my uh, dosage, uh, uh, when I work on my dosage, um, I'm working with two different things. I'm working with the sweetness and I'm working with the color. So, you know, uh, yeah, I, I have to decide which kind of color I want. And then after I have to decide which kind of, uh, of sweetness I want. So that's going to I'm, I'm combine these two parameters to get to build up my dosage every year to fit the wine. And it's, uh, you know, like, uh, obviously, I might have to use a little bit more sweetness on the 2020 compared to the 2019. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, um, uh, you know, I will try to keep the same amount of, of uh, red wine going in there. But so what will change will be the amount of sugar. So I, it's not an easy answer, uh, Mike. I'm, you know, I, I don't have a... I, I'm, I'm doing it as I go, so I don't have a true, I mean, I've got a method of how I do it, how I get there, but I don't have a, a formula that's already made. And Matthew, are you making the Petit Verdot, are you making for the dosage in a specific way, or is it just, nope. yeah, yeah. Nope. yeah. I mean, I should, I probably should, <laughs> but, but I don't. And, uh, you know, you're, at the end, you really don't need a lot, uh, and, uh, and the reason why also I, uh, I choose Petit Verdot, it's, I mean, it's what I've got the most color here, uh, and I think it works. It works well. Uh, who knows if I had some uh, Chambourcin, I might have used Chambourcin instead of uh, a light style Chambourcin with heavy color. It might have worked maybe better to do that, but it's not something that I've done. So there are um, the the Eno France materials. They go through. There's one of those presentations that's all about making sparkling rosé, and they go through all of these things about how to make your your red different to in order to blend it in to make your rosé, um, and but that's probably for people that are making a whole lot of it too. So yes, I'm, I'm, uh, I've made 250, 300 cases of, of rosé so far. Once I get thousand cases of roses, and maybe I'll start to be a little bit more precise with uh, <laughs> with the wine for my dosage. Exactly. Okay, so Jocelyn says that um, the higher acidity in the tank samples makes it more linear. Um, and I think, yeah, we have that, that more linear structure there. Shai felt like the, um, there was a weight difference in the barrels and complexity and some character there that gave it a slight cookie dough aroma, which I, I get that sort of richness in it. Um, and, it and there is that, it, the, I feel like that linearity gives us a little bit different perception on the palate in terms of, um, of that acidity response as well. Um, Jocelyn also feels that the astringency was more apparent 
in the barrel with ML, as well as the aroma is distinctly more oak. And yeah, again, just, it, that's, uh, that's always fascinating to me how the difference in the, in the chemistry of the wine will show us these barrel differences. But we do know too that, you know, no two barrels are exactly the same because they come from different trees. So we can do the best that we can to control that as much as possible, but there are always those barrel differences too. So um, we, it, it, it's hard to interpret those kinds of, of things, whether that's about the base wine in, in barrels in general, or if, you know, two barrels are same Cooper, same year, but they still came from different trees. So, so just, yeah, to, but I, 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 I think we can, uh, I, I think overall, uh, all the one that had the malolactic fermentation, I had the, uh, the, I was feeling that it was tasting more like barrel. Again, it's, I think that there's, there's something with a, with the radioactive fermentation flavor that's always make me feel like the barrel is showing more. And uh, and it's not especially because of the difference of barrel. I think it's a, it's a perception in general. I, I would agree with you in the sense that I often get um, sensory responses where people will mention the perception of oak in things that were fermented in stainless steel um, when we do our blind sensory kind of thing. So even if it's, if it's in stainless steel, if it's gone through malolactic, we often sort of are, are, are um, the, the set of flavors and, and aromas that we associate together are so strong that we think about that as oak. So we, I think those are, are very tightly um, correlated in our, in our sensory perception for sure. Um, and usually they go together so that, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that, that we think about it that way. So, um, well, I do wanna make sure to honor everybody's time. So I'll kind of do a last call for, for questions or comments here. Um, we will be, you know, I, I do have a little bit more introductory material that I'll put into the report for this. And like I said, those two resources, um, if you're interested in kind of digging deeper into this topic, Bruce's Method Champenois it, uh, PDF is available on the Virginia Tech Enology Notes website and the Eno France materials. I am happy to get those to you if you're interested in delving deeper into that. So last thoughts, Mathieu? Uh no, I mean again, like I think it's uh, very often it's in bad years that you that you learn the, the most, and uh, probably never have worked that much on like Malik and uh, and uh, base wine uh, if if you would have had a, a normal vintage. So I'm not going to say I was, I'm thankful for 2020, but uh, <laughs> but I, I mean at least I've learned something, and uh, and. Maybe next year I'll make a better uh, sparkling wine. So you know, like you never know. It's uh, year after year you kind of like uh, learn a bit more about where you want to be and what works for you. And uh, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, there's always something to learn. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us what what you were working with and what you were learning along the way. Um, and so we many thanks to to Matthew and to King family. We also always want, want to change, uh, thank the Virginia Wine Board for funding, and thanks to each one of you for sharing your thoughts and your insights, and for for filling out your sensory forms and helping us um, keep this rolling as we keep going. So hopefully, I will see you in two weeks. Um, and if, if either way, I hope that stays nice and warm near you and doesn't get too cold over the weekend. So um, thanks again, everybody, and we will see you next time. Yep.